Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I'm absolutely delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Nandita Shah from India, all the way from India. We're getting her up at the crack of dawn here. She is a medical physician with special training in homeopathy. She has a, a wonderful book, uh, Reversing Diabetes in 21 Days. She is the uh, founder of an organization called Sharon, which is really involved with the Sanctuary for Health and Reconnection with Animals in Nature, a really beautiful organization that's attempting to create a kind of a culture of wellness, if you will. And she's the winner of a very prestigious award in India called the Nari Shakti Puruskar. Did I say that right? Am I close? Yes. yes, which is about an award given to people or organizations that do um, empower work to empower women. And she did this empowerment in India. So welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. It's totally my honor. Yeah, as we go through this, so people can get to know you, you know, it's always interesting to have a little bit of the backstory of people. And I know in reading a little bit about you, that you were basically brought up as a vegetarian, but like a number of people I know in India, that was still connection with dairy products. And then sometimes that part of it happens later. Talk a little bit about your early... Uh, exposure to you know the whole lifestyle and and what kind of turns you on to move away from even the dairy products so i grew up as a vegetarian but i was consuming a lot of dairy because uh, we were told that you need milk for protein and so i'd have three glasses of milk per day and then some yogurt and once in a while other milk products as well I grew up at a time when milk was not easily available and my parents went out of their way to get milk because they thought it was so good for us. And then my father was working with another organization called Beauty Without Cruelty in India and they were working on making cheese vegetarian because um, they use micro, uh, you know, normally they use cow's rennet for cheese. But um, they were trying to use microbile rennet for cheese instead so that so many vegetarians could consume cheese. Actually, vegetarians already consume cheese once in a while, but they didn't know that it contained calf rennet. So uh, when my father got to know about it and then he realized that milk kills calves, then he told us about it and at that time it was still difficult for us to change because dairy was such a um, important part of our lifestyle but it kind of went in my head that um, I be, I'm vegetarian and I'm happy to be vegetarian because of the cruelty involved in eating meat so how could I eat dairy? And I also became a doctor to reduce suffering. And when I realized about the huge suffering in the dairy industry, I kind of knew I had to give up dairy. At that time, there were no, I mean, vegan wasn't a word known here in India. There was no soya milk in the market. There was nothing. And um, so I didn't leave it completely like once in a while. If someone had cooked food with butter or ghee, I used to eat it until there was this, um, the editor of Beauty Without Cruelty who was sitting in my um, living room and talking to me. And he told me that he was completely vegan and that just did it for me. I went vegan overnight. And then... Right. Hmm? 
No, go ahead. I'm going to finish. Yeah, I'm listening. And I used to teach homeopathy all over the world at that time, including in the U.S. So then I went to the U. The next time I went to the U.S., I went to an animal conference and. There was a movie after the conference and Ingrid Newkirk was there. And I just remember, like, I was so grateful that I had turned vegan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, my partner lives in England. She's a trained homeopath in Imperial College from England. So I'm very familiar with the work. And I know you talked about doing that because you felt that it would be less harmful than many of the typical medications and treatments that are typically done. Let me ask you a question. When you train in um, in India, like, let me understand a little bit about medical education. Is it is it still very much a part of the way it's taught in the West? It's very focused on medical medication and surgery and all of these kinds of things? Or is there a little bit more of a holistic vision in the Indian? I'm, I'm assuming you were trained in India as a medical physician. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes I was. And in India, we have medical, like, allopathic medical colleges and homeopathic medical colleges and Ayurvedic medical colleges and the whole medical college system is similar. Like, for example, in the first year we have anatomy and physiology and in the second year we have, you know, uh, preventive and social medicine and forensic medicine along with um, surgery and gynac and general medicine. Right, right. And we start going to hospitals and everything. So it's um, it's a full medical education, but starting right in the beginning with something more alternative. Yeah, so when you get into your clinical part of everything, you can deviate into a number of different directions, Ayurveda, homeopathy, medicine, so on. Uh, I gather there were a couple of turning points for you, two additional turning points. One was... Uh, being exposed to Dean Ornish's book, you know, Reversing Heart Disease. And I also noticed that w into your time as a physician, uh, you developed Guillain-Barre syndrome and you wound up going through a, your own journey to healing that really turned you on to the more lifestyle approach. Can you speak to that? Can you let the audience know about that journey and what happened to you? Yeah, I mean, I was shocked that I got Guillain-Barre and I even knew what I had when I got it because of my medical training. And I was thinking, what did I get it from? And of course, you know, the medical books at that time said it could come from chicken or, and I was vegetarian, and, or vaccinations. And I would had a dog bite and had a rabies vaccination. Took one, I didn't want to take vaccinations. I never take vaccinations, but I was scared. And then I went back to see the dog and the dog was fine. So I didn't take any more than one rabies vaccination. And that could have been the trigger or it could have been something else. I, I really don't know what it was, but... Um, and were you, were, you were you devastatingly paralyzed? What was going on? Tell the audience what you were experiencing. So, I was experiencing paralysis from my feet upwards and a time came when I couldn't stand up or couldn't really get out of bed. And then it went further so that I couldn't even turn in the bed. And so uh, my father took me to his house and uh, we had someone come in in the uh, day and one person in the night to even turn me in the bed and help me with bodily functions. And because I went to the hospital just to get a proper diagnosis, just to be sure. And I saw a neurologist and of course they wanted to admit me and I knew that I didn't want to take the treatment, which was current at that time, which was steroids and immunoglobulins. So, um, so I was so lucky that my father supported me. My mother wasn't alive. And um, yeah, that, that was it. I was looking after myself at home. It took six months before I could even walk with a walking stick or a... Uh, wow. Yeah, it was something, you know, so but you I, were, So you were bedridden for six months? 
Yes, I was. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. That's pretty intense. But you were living, you were really embracing a vegan diet through that process? Is that what you were doing? No, at that time, I wasn't 100% vegan. Uh, okay. Um, but I was like 90% vegan. So okay. I have to say that there were a few things that went okay. wrong there. But um, by the time I could walk with a walker and things like that, it was soon after that that I became 100% vegan. Um, so, yeah, it was a process. Really, wow. it was a process. I'm here with Dr. Nandita Shah. Let me just take a few moments to take a break for uh, hear a word from our sponsor, the National Health Association. We'll be right back. You're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. Dr. Frank Sabatino here. Are you ready for an extraordinary adventure that combines relaxation, exploration, and vibrant health? Then set your sails for the NHA plant exclusive cruises. Imagine cruising through exotic destinations, savoring delectable plant-based cuisine, and engaging in rejuvenating activities, all while surrounded by like-minded individuals passionate about health and wellness. These cruises offer more than just a vacation. They offer an opportunity to immerse yourself in the NHA's principles of healthy living. And they rank incredibly high on the ratings of eco-friendly cruise lines. We all know how important our oceans are, and our cruise partner, Windstar, is fully committed to this. Join us aboard our upcoming plant-exclusive cruises and experience the synergy of health and leisure. Delight in gourmet SOS-free meals prepared by talented chefs. Attend informative workshops and enjoy the serenity of the sea, all tailored to nourish your body, mind, and spirit. For more details and to reserve your spot on our next adventure, visit healthscience.org and click the link under travel. Don't miss this chance to indulge in a wellness retreat like no other. Elevate your well-being and make memories that will last a lifetime. And remember, your feedback matters. Please take a moment to leave a rating and a review wherever you're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host, and I'm here with Dr. Nandita Shah from India. And we're talking about her journey into wellness, so to speak, coming through a, a major episode of paralysis, Guillain-Barre syndrome with, that she experienced and uh, took a step toward healing herself. And that was a kind of a that was kind of a turning point in your mind for self-healing. Is that what you feel or how, how did you process that that whole episode? No, I think, like I really understood the principles of healing through homeopathy largely, which is why I didn't. Um, go into any other kind of treatment. I did have a colleague treat me with homeopathy at that time, um, but nothing seemed to be working. But I knew that this was an acute autoimmune disease, and I knew that if I don't die, I'll recover. Right. Let's put it that way, right. you know? And, and I kind of had the faith that things would get better. And, and, you know, over a period of time, like I knew from the books that it would get worse and worse and worse, and then stop and then start getting better. And that's what I saw. And I had a physiotherapist who came uh, in every now and then to help me move my muscles and, you know, set up the uh, bed so that I could move a little bit more than I actually had a hospital bed put into the house so that I could, um, you know, you could just do this and get the bed up so that I could eat and things like that. So it was a process, but from that I learned so much because I learned how to treat autoimmune diseases. I learned that the body always works to heal if we get out of the way. I learned what are the things that we have to do to get out of the way. And when I had auto, when I had Guillain-Barre, it wasn't just a paralysis of all the um, muscles. It was also a paralysis of the brain. I couldn't, th 
think properly. Like, for example, I was bedridden, but I couldn't watch a TV show for more than a few minutes because I didn't have the attention span. Right, right. So, so it was a number of things that was happening together. So, Nandita, what then was the uh, what what provoked you? Or what was the major interest in diabetes that you really made this re really wonderful book? What what was the uh, motivation for wanting to address diabetes? So, you know, after I got better, I went back to teaching homeopathy and traveling again. And uh, my brother lives in Washington D.C. And Dr. Neil Barnard had written the book. Uh, Dr. Neil Barnard's program for reversing diabetes. And uh, that book struck me. Then um, I, I had started Sharan and Dr. Neil Barnard came to India. And, you know, like I was giving programs at that time, which were general health programs. I realized that you know, I started out with giving talks in different places and I used, used to have audiences full, just full, but then people would go out and they wouldn't hesitate to have tea with milk or an ice cream soon after my talk. <laughs> and they loved my talks, but they, it didn't go in their mind. So I was thinking, how am I going to get people to understand what I understand? And I started doing a program called Peas versus Pills, where I would serve breakfast and then lunch and snacks. And it would be a whole day seminar and all the food would be totally plant based and whole. Um, in the beginning, it was not completely whole. We used a bit of oil, but then it became whole after uh, Dr. Neil Barnard came to India. And when Dr. Neil Barnard was coming, he said that, should I um, do a holistic program? And I said, no, you know, I'm already, I was already doing holistic programs, but I realized that people didn't want to know about health. People wanted to get rid of their diseases. And he had written that book. So I said, why don't you do programs on reversing diabetes? So uh, we had arranged, um, different seminars in uh, major hospitals in Bombay, as well as teaching hospitals, as well as for general public. And he was giving these seminars and I realized that I should also start with reversing diabetes. So he was my inspiration to do reversing diabetes. And then you wrote that book and that book has a, now I'm assuming that with some of the eating habits, even in India, that diabetes is a major problem too. About one third of the adult population right. has diabetes in India. Because there, there, there can be weight issues and obesity issues even throughout India. I know. So, so that book has helped quite a few people when you set that when you set that in motion. I'm really amazed at the number of people who've seen that book, um, because you know we didn't have anything to um, help spread the word or anything. It was just put out in the world and it became a bestseller without doing anything for it. And that was largely because of the publishing house Penguin, I think, you know? Oh yeah. So you had a really good publisher that took it up. That's beautiful. Yeah. In fact, they were the ones who asked me to write the book. So yeah. I was really lucky that, you know, at the time when I wanted to write a book, they just came and, and they kind of like, they made me sign the contract. So the book got written. Let's put it that way. That's beautiful. Well, that's great. And it's in, and it's done such a great service for people. Now, I know that you're very much an ethical vegan, meaning that you were always from the get go, from the beginning, concerned about harming animals. And you had a very Himza related mindset about this. So I noticed that you went and spent some time at the farm sanctuary with Gene Bauer and those people. Tell me about that. How, how did that come about and how and, and what was that experience like? Well, you know, when I became vegan, I really wanted to start a farm sanctuary. And I was talking to a friend and she just Googled and there was farm sanctuary. And so I knew I had to go <laughs> and I went there. But when I came back, there were so many issues because to buy the land and to have the money 
to have support of different people. There was nobody vegan. I mean, it was like, and then a friend of mine said that, you know, you should use the skills that you have as a doctor. And I realized that it was true. So that's where I really started helping people reverse diseases by, so helping people while helping animals. So that's where the organization Sharon came into be, the one that you created. So let's talk yeah. about that and let's talk about how that evolved and, and, you know, tell me more and more about it so our audience can learn about it. So Sharon basically started as a health organization. And as I told you, I started with the um, peas versus pills seminars and graduated to reversing diabetes and reversing hypertension. And then I did a combined seminar reversing diabetes and hypertension and um, various talks on weight loss and so on and so forth. And as I did these, there were people who shifted, they got better and they wanted to join Sharon. And then I started training programs like help because I had a training of speaking in public um, because I was teaching all over the world. But I knew that if I wanted to grow, more people had to do this kind of work. So I was doing training programs for doctors and nutritionists and um, people who wanted to do cooking classes because at that time I used to also do a lot of cooking classes to teach people how to cook without um, oil or sugar or any refined ingredients, totally plant-based. And um, Sharon, by the way, has 600 free delicious recipes on our website that anyone can use. And that also came over a period of time. And so as more people wanted to do things, when I had the training program, they always had the option to join Sharon or to join and do it on their own. And so over a period of time, many people joined Sharon. Some people left also, and we grew and grew. And now we are 50 strong. So we have a team of doctors and nutritionists and facilitators. And we didn't have the place for a center up to now. We had two offices, one in Oroville where I live and one in Mumbai. So we used to just rent places and do events all the time. And people used to invite us to do events as well. Like we did some corporate events and events for different groups. And our goal is always to help people switch to a whole food plant-based diet in order to get healthy again. And I realized that when people shifted and they didn't have, didn't need to justify eating animal products, their mindset changed as well. I also realized that a lot of people were suffering from depression and anxiety and emotional issues. And I used to wake up in the morning every day with anxiety. And I didn't, I, I, I you know, it went away at a certain time and I didn't realize it until I went to Spain for a conference. And when I landed there, there was nothing to eat that was vegan that I could eat. Like there were lots of salads. There was a big exhibition hall and there were lots of salads with cold cuts on top. And I wouldn't have eaten anything that were, meat was lying on top. So eventually I ordered some French fries and they came with um, ketchup and mayonnaise on top kind of. And I thought, should I take out the mayonnaise or and then I thought, okay, now the chicken has died anyway and I'm really hungry. And it was after being vegan for so long that I actually had French fries with mayonnaise and ketchup. And I woke up the next morning with anxiety and that anxiety didn't go away for 10 days. And it, may, it helped me. It was another patient as well who recognized this. So that patient and me, my experience, I realized that we are carrying the emotions of the animals that we consume. You know, and um, 
that made a big shift in my uh, way of working. So I always, you know, with homeopathy, I always combine mind and body. Okay. And I do believe that stress causes disease and physical disease also causes stress. And so um, I started helping people recognize that their emotional issues were often because of what they were eating. And is that is that stress component, that stress response management, has that been built into your Sharon project, the, the, the work that you do? Do you teach people sk skills and tools for stress management in their lives? Do you do that too in your work? To some extent. To some because, extent. Because um, in our one-day seminars, there's not enough time. Right. Right. But, I, but, but I know you do 21 day seminars. You, I saw yes. that. So there it's a complete education, Okay. you know, and we do a lot of things and then they realize, but you know, Sharon also has counselors. For example, we have a counselor, Jayshree, and she had cancer. She took chemotherapy and then she, within nine months, she got a recurrence and she went back with chemotherapy, but she recognized that medicines never cure. And someone had given her a book by Louise Hay. And she was already um, in the psych psychology field. And she read that book and started attending all kinds of seminars and really healed herself through mind shift and diet together, you know? And she's helped so many people now. So we have, the, we have an amazing team. Has the climate in India been much more accepting of the kind of work you do? I mean, what I mean is, does the medical profession of India, are they more and more open to this idea of lifestyle correction and the impact on reversing disease? Or is it still something that there's a little bit of reaction to, negative reaction to? What would you say? So I'm seeing patients every single day and many of them are going to their regular doctors to get checkups as well because they came to me through that and their doctors are not accepting. But right. the patients have seen the results and they, and my goal is always, you know, I'm seeing very difficult cases these days. Cases of kidney failure, autoimmune disease, cancers, and of course, diabetes and hypertension and asthma, all that comes. But, um, and so they are being, they are coming with a whole list of medications. And my work is to get them better and reduce medications and get them better and reduce more medications and eventually have them off all the medications. And my 21 day retreats, which we've done 19, we do only once a year or twice a year. And we've done 19 of them. And um, that has also really helped me understand because there I'm seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, because I'm there for the of whole course. 21 days. And it's so amazing how the body heals. Like it blew my mind as well, even though I knew it, uh, that people could get better and get off so many medications in just 21 days, because we do all the tests in the beginning and all the tests in the end. And the end is really not the end because it's like day 16, because we have to get the reports back and give them feedback and everything. And um, in just 16 days, after cutting down so many medications, like I've had patients come in on 24 different medications and go out on just four in 21 days, you know? I've seen results like that. I've, I've seen results where people, and, and their reports are better than when they came in. And I've seen that the more medications they're on, the faster it is to get rid of medications because the medications are like a pack of cards, you know, they're just balancing each other and when you, get rid of medications, everything falls. So uh, they don't need those medications anymore. It's just, those retreats have been just amazing. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing to be able to watch 
the wisdom and healing power of the body, even as physicians. I, you know, after 40 plus years of doing this, it still blows my mind to be able to be, I'm so grateful to be able to be next to that. You know what I'm saying? Um, yes. Before we go on, I want people to be able to know where to go to find you. So tell them the web address where they can find out more about you. Okay, so it's sharan-india.org. And I highly recommend that for recipes and events. You know, since the pandemic, many of our events have become online. Yeah, like everybody, so we've all been doing that. Yeah. From anywhere in the world. And if you can't join the event, you can even get the recording instead. So if anyone wants to learn some things, we have a lot of free events. We have a lot of uh, paid events. People can join whatever they like. And uh, our YouTube channel has so much information as well. Um, I noticed, uh, I want to get into this just a little bit, that it said that you had moved to that very interesting spiritual community, Oroville, uh, which was really uh, inspired by Sri Aurobindo and, and the mother. And I know it has a very strong spiritual base for human connection and community. So is that where you're operating out of now, mostly in terms of your practice? Is that where people come to, to see you? Yes, I am. And, you know, you brought this up and there's an interesting story behind it. Yeah, please. When sure. I got out of uh, Gia Bare, I was, I went, I was speaking at a conference in Ireland and a very close friend of mine, who's also a homeopath from Germany, was there. And she suggested that we stay back after the conference and just talk about why I had got Gia Bare and what I needed to do to shift. And so while we were talking there, uh, she suggested that I had to change my life completely because it was the life that I had in Mumbai. Mumbai is a very busy city and I had a very busy practice. Uh, so she said that you got to change completely because that life has a connection to your disease. And I didn't really, I wasn't ready to change, but I made a promise to her and I knew in my heart that I had to do it. So uh, Oroville was a place that I had been coming to um, once a year, maybe for a week or two for the last 10 years. And, and I decided to move here and it was the best move of my life because I wouldn't have started Sharon, I think, if I hadn't moved to Oroville. You know, it was just, um, it changed my life completely for the better. Because it was uh, totally different from Mumbai. Mumbai was uh, about um, progress and money and, uh, you know, and Oroville was totally different and it changed my life. Yeah, so the, you, you kind of left a lot of the materialism of uh, Mumbai and moved here. So tell yeah. us about, tell me more about Oroville. How is it? I know that they do classes and people can visit. I, you know, how does it work? You can actually buy property or move in there, or how how does that operate? And tell me oh, about no. how it is to live in that community. So all the land that is in Oroville belongs to Oroville. And um, you can build a house and you can live there if you're accepted as an Aurovillian. Uh, there's a procedure where you have to volunteer for two years and, um, and people kind of check you out. They're very accepting of most people, truly. Um, right now, Auroville is going through some political issues, but in general, it's just a beautiful place. For me, for me, it was really good because it brought me close to nature. And when I moved into the little house on the beach that I live in, even today, 24 years ago, um, a cat moved in with me. I had never lived with an animal in my life. And I started watching the animals. I wasn't feeding her. I was watching her. And I realized that animals in nature know how to be well. And we know how to be sick. And as I watched her more, I realized, and other animals too, because I was living in nature and not far from the beach, and um, in a kind of 
semi-forest. So I realized that um, there's so much to learn from animals and nature. And, you know, I, I also like when, um, when I explain to patients, I explain to them about their instincts. Like all animals eat by instincts and so do we, so should we. But we've lost our instincts because we've been told that we're omnivores. If we were to be on a farm or an orchard and we see fruits and vegetables, instinctively we feel like eating them. But you don't feel instinctively, um, like you don't salivate when you see fields of wheat or rice because we can't eat that raw, right? And so many people have gluten intolerance because wheat is anyway not our food. So I help people understand, you know, when you see a chicken walk by or a goat, our mouth doesn't water. And when we, you know, every baby loves their mother's milk, but when they first given cow's milk, they don't like it. And that's why people add sugar and cocoa into the milk and run around their children for half an hour to make their children drink the milk. And that happened to me and my family too. So I just had them make the connection that instinctively we are actually herbivores and there are certain foods that we should eat more. And truly when I'm treating some very serious diseases, I ask people to have largely raw meals. And the, the food supply where you are, it's a good food supply where you are? The uh, fruits and vegetable uh, uh, available. The fruits and vegetable availability is it good where you are? It's really good. Oh, that's and beautiful. it's really good all over India because India is a tropical right country. Um, organic is not available everywhere. Organic was not easily available when I was here, but now it's becoming more common almost everywhere. I do recommend organic always, but. Um, uh, even if they can't get organic where they are. And in some small villages in India, you can't get organic. It's fine. I let them do, get the very best that they can get. Yeah, well, and, you, in those little villages and places like that, they're not going to be using industrial poisons to grow their food either. So oh, when you're getting no, local... Monsanto, I mean, these pesticide companies have reached everywhere. That's where they're going. You know, right. so they've taught all the farmers. The farmers have like we've done with our bodies, the farmers have seen their soil deteriorate right? and then change their uh, farming to organic in many places. Well, that's beautiful. That's excellent. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. With all the things you have going on, do you have any projects that you want to do? What's the direction for you? What are you hoping to, to do next or to do ongoing? What are you, what are you connected to? So, you know, I found a, place where we were doing our retreats, uh, not the 21 day retreat, but another retreat, which is in Pune. It's called the Hidden Oasis. And um, they started out, they were actually Muslim. Muslims are usually non-vegetarian. So they must have started out as non-vegetarians, but they started this retreat center as a vegetarian retreat center. And now they've turned it vegan completely wow. from our retreats and other people's retreats and from their own spiritual inclination. And uh, uh, we are thinking of establishing together because they already have organic farms and a retreat center. And they've also rescued a few animals. So, you know, that brings everything that we've done together, like what I've done and what they've done into what I'd like Sharon to be. Right. So that people can make the connection like people made the connection at Farm Sanctuary. You know, when you meet the animals, you can eat them less, right? right. So, so, so things are coming together. Well, that's one of the issues when you have your own house pets because they become like a member of the family. So when people yeah. get to know these animals, there's a, it moves, you know, there's always this thing. Why do people look at animals as things? 
and not as beings. And the reason yeah. is, is that they've not really been able to put a name or a, a, a spirit to them. So they have more license to harm them. So there's no reason for that. And if you can get that kind of a mentality where you really see these animals as just a connection to you, they're just an extension of us, we're an extension of them. And when you have that oneness, the likelihood of wanting to harm anything starts to disappear. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Nandita, as we wind this down, do you have any final words or messages you'd like to share with the audience out here? Well, you know, I, it just struck me that, like, my father is going to be 90 next year. Wow. And he's really healthy and not on any medications. And, you know, we've all been, like, as I told you, we were partially vegan. Um, it's more than 40 years. And 100% vegan is only 22 years. But um, that inclination has been there. And my father is totally healthy. And my two brothers live in the U.S. And so they are saying that, why don't you come to the U.S. for the last time? And we'll all be together as a family. So we are all going there. In I mean, all coming to you in April next year. So I'm excited and I'm going to be doing a few talks there. So I'm looking oh, beautiful. forward. Beautiful. Where will you be going? To Washington, D.C., okay. to Sacramento and California, and to Florida. Oh, where in Florida? I don't know because <laughs> my brother has a house in Florida, but I'm not sure exactly. Because I, I, I run fasting and vegan retreats in Florida. Oh, that's well, wonderful. Once a month, we do seven day retreats where people come and eat completely vegan, and we will do some water fasting and we do juicing and things of that nature, and we do lectures and education. But I'm in a place called Deerfield Beach, which is right on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, just about an hour north of Miami, but it's right on the ocean. It's pretty. But that's a, that's quite an itinerary. Those are different places. Washington, Sacramento, and Florida is a big, you're covering and, the whole country. And that's because, you know, one brother lives in Washington, D.C., the other lives in Sacramento, and my brother in Washington, D.C. has bought a house in Florida. Well, that's beautiful. When is that going to happen? In April? In April. Okay. So I'll keep you informed. You keep us informed. Let the let our let Kathleen and everybody know for sure. Well, I can't thank you enough. I, I want to thank my special guest, Dr. Nandita Shah, today from India. We got her up in the early morning to share her beautiful inside her heart, all of the beautiful work she's doing to help empower people with plant exclusive living and helping them really uh, you know, take an active role in helping themselves heal. And I want to really thank you for being with us today. And I want to really thank our audience out there because without you, we can't do what we do. And I want to thank you for being part of this very active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.